I've always seen me and Dale as very different bowlers. He could swing the ball 90 miles an hour plus. Oh, beautifully bowled. That's a wonderful delivery. When I first saw him, you just knew he was a special talent. It's a first test wicket for Dale Stay, and he's loving every moment of that. We both got the same kind of ball, you know, like what we're famous for, I guess, you know, it just comes out the hand beautifully. Dale's someone who I've definitely watched, in particular with a Kookaburra ball. How do you swing that red Kookaburra? Oh, what a beauty! What an incredible delivery that is! Jimmy's skill is ridiculous. You know, I'm actually, a, I'm a bit of a fan. I'm not even going to lie, Jimmy, I'm a fan. Yeah. Etched. Anderson. My game and my career changed once I, I got that outswinger and uh, I had a lot more success against left-handers. That's uh, pretty much a trademark stay in delivery. These two, they are quite remarkable bowlers. Hello and welcome to another Sky Sports Cricket Lockdown Vodcast. As ever, I'm joined by Nasser Hussain. And as our guest, we have the two bowlers of a generation. One is Jimmy Anderson, who has at the moment 584 test wickets, which puts him at the top of the tree of all the seamers in world cricket ever. And the other is Dale Stain, who has 439 wickets. That's the most for any South African and had a ridiculous strike rate of just 42. As you can probably guess, we're going to be talking about bowling. Um, Jimmy, I'll start with you. Do you two know each other at all? Have you spent much time together? Not really, no. Um, I wouldn't have said it off, off the field, not spent too much time together. I've always had beer, a beer after the uh, end of a series. Um, but we've had a few chats on the field as, uh, over the years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was actually saying now, Jimmy, I haven't actually spent a lot of time talking to you before. Like... I don't know who dropped me the message originally. I think Sean Pollock let me know that Keezy was going to get hold of me. Um, and he said that you were going to be involved. I actually got quite excited. I was like, jeepers, he has an opportunity to speak to the folk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Like, I, think, um, I think with the amount of cricket we've played, certainly the, the, the amount of cricket in the last 10 years, you just don't get the opportunity to spend much time with. Un unless, uh, and I'm, I'm not played IPL, so unless you play one of the franchise T20s yeah. and you're actually on the team with someone you don't actually get to spend much time with the opposition uh, players so it's been uh, yeah it'd be nice to have a chat I think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when, Dals, when did it begin I mean were you always fast I remember Jimmy as a young kid was pretty quick what about you were you always just a tear away fast bowler as a youngster yeah I was I think I was I was you know the thing is I grew up in a small town where there wasn't a lot of cricket and when you're excelling in something, you kind of leapfrog everybody, you know. So I started playing men's club cricket and all of a sudden I was bowling quicker than the men. And it really gave, you, it gave me this kind of confidence that I, I thought I was like the big fish, you know. Um, it was only when I moved to Pretoria uh, and, and I was among some of the other players that were there. Steve Elworthy, Elworthy was part of the Titans, you know, all these other guys that I realized, well, there's a lot of other guys that bowl quite quickly too, you know. And... Um, but throughout like high school, I, I thought I was, I, I thought I was the man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> On the back of that, Dale, would you say then that bowling fast can be taught or is it just a natural skill someone has? I think you've got to have the natural ability to bowl fast. You get to the, the schoolyard and you can tell straight away who has got pace and then who you might need to work with to fix up the action a little bit. But if you've got the pace straight away, then, you know, when I was growing up, I wasn't really taught to bowl line and length. I was just told stick to pace, bowl as fast as you can. If I bowled 30 wides in a game, it didn't matter. But if I bowled, you know, five or six straights, I'd probably hit the poles. So that's all my, my captains ever wanted me to do. Um, and they always said, we'll teach you how to bowl, you know, line and length later, but never lose your pace. What about you, Jimmy? The same? You similar? Yeah, so I was probably 14 or 15 when I first started bowling quick. I was uh, sort of third and fourth change before that. Couldn't bat either, still back then. Um, <laughs> so I just, yeah, I, w I was a fielder as a, as a kid. And then it wasn't until I was 15 when I, I grew that bit taller uh, and just all of a sudden want, well, came back one winter with my club and, and started bowling quite quick. Um, and similarly to Dale, like everyone I grew up with, all the coaches and the players that I played with said, just bowl quick. It doesn't matter where it goes. Um, we just want you to scare the opposition. And if you get the odd one on the stumps, then great. You probably get a wicket. And, when I first signed for Lancashire when I was 18, that was when Mike Watkinson got hold of me and tried to develop a bit of control 
uh, into my game. I mean, Dale talks about pace coming naturally. When you let that ball go as a young bowler, did you always have your wrist behind the ball? Did it always swing? No, I didn't swing. I kind of, I, tr I just held the, the seam st as straight as I possibly could. So when I was bowling quick, it, it, I think it come out fairly straight. Um, and because of my action, it, every now and then it sort of, I bowl a leg cutter, um, but definitely couldn't swing it until I, I joined Lancashire. And like I said, Mike Watkinson was the second team coach at the time. And he actually taught me to, to swing the ball. You both, interestingly, I mean, Jimmy, you played for England when you were 20, you hadn't played much first class cricket. And Dale, you the same. So, in a way, what is it that sort of separates guys that can go in very early on without a lot of bowling and you're almost having to learn an international cricket? What was it that earmarked you to be able to go and do that or to get selected in the first place? I was playing with the Titans at the time and I actually, my first season, I lost my contract and um, I was doing a bit of coaching on the side and, and whatever. Mornay Morkel and Faf Duplessis were the two rookie, they got the two rookie contracts with the Titans and I, I wasn't. And um, Daryl Cullinan had been pulled in. It's when, the, it's when Easterns and Titans had become one union. Yeah. And uh, he had seen me in the nets and he said, I want, you, I want you around. So I'd do coaching in the mornings and then I'd go to cricket practice in the afternoon. And uh, at the time, South Africa, we played against you. We played against England that, at the That's end right. of that year. And Ray Jennings was actually the coach of the South African team. Ray and Daryl were very close. And... You know, when I look back at it now, I know exactly what was going on. Daryl was in Ray's ear and he was saying, you need this guy, you need this guy. Um, but back then, you know, I didn't know, I didn't connect the dots as well. Um, so now I can be more thankful of somebody like Daryl for being the captain um, and kind of guiding me along my way and, and getting me into the South African team. But I was terrible. You know, I played that series and then I was gone for two years. You know, it just, just showed that I wasn't good enough. I couldn't land the ball consistently in the right place uh, for long enough. And I had to go and play domestic cricket. You know, I had to play some county cricket. I had to play more uh, franchise cricket to just learn how to bowl, you know, because I had the talent, but, you know, I just couldn't package it together. But it's bowling is tough, you know. Like, batting is tough, but bowling is... There's nowhere to hide in bowling, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the thing is, Nas, you ask that question about who spots the talent. You were the man who gave Jimmy his first cap. What is it that you saw in him? Well... I didn't see anything. I remember being, we were playing the Prime Minister's Eleven on that Ashes tour, where the, every Ashes tour, the wheels were coming off. But this one specifically, the wheels were coming off. We were getting walloped. All the bowlers were getting injured. There was no golf. Flintoff was injured. Jones was injured. Everyone was just falling apart. And I remember <laughs> whoever saying, what yes, mate, I, was, I was what was left. Was <laughs> <laughs> it was the bottom of this barrel that we were trying to scrape. <laughs> and... Uh, Someone said, there's this lad at Lancashire, Jimmy Anderson, and I'm like Googling Jimmy Anderson. And he's played a couple of games for Burnley and he's in the Lancashire second team. And he's played a few first class games. And I said, come on, get him over. He can't be any worse than, than what we've got. And I tell you now, to this day, when I first saw him, you just knew he was a special talent. That sort of natural bowler that England just doesn't produce. We do not produce. It's almost like those... Videos now you see in Twitter of young Pakistan bowlers running in on a yeah. dirt track and bowling. Jimmy Anderson was the most naturally gifted bowler I had seen, and he was he was absolutely outstanding. Differently, yeah, it's a pretty big ground and a pretty impressive place to make your debut, and I'm sure he's up to it. Um, you know, he's a good Lancashire lad. Will please bumble in the in the office or whatever. But um, now he's got his chance. It won't be easy for him with the two openers. But, you know, we've got to start giving people their chances. He deserves it. There was quite a big group of players out there. And I, I just remember being sort of in awe of all these guys that I'd seen on TV. And um, <laughs> just an amazing time for me as a 20-year-old, you know, getting your new kit and just being able to chat to these guys about cricket um, was phenomenal. And I kind of just thought, well, you know, I, I knew I was there because everyone was injured. Um, so I was just going to enjoy it for as long as it lasted. And uh, I think that kind of helped me a bit sort of you know you don't the, the pressure wasn't um I didn't feel the pressure as much as maybe if I was say 25 26 and you were sort of you know you'd had that all the, the county cricket behind you I was kind of just yeah enjoying the the time I, I didn't know how, how long it was going to last so I just thought I'd enjoy it it wouldn't have been long before South Africa and the World Cup and you got wickets at Newlands which would have then given you a bit of do you know what I can do this is that fair 
the second game I played, I got uh, wickets. Luckily, we played Sri Lanka at Perth, which was like really bouncy and something that I don't think they were used to playing on that kind of surface. So I got four wickets in that game, and immediately, like second game in, I, th I thought, yeah, I can I can do this. Uh, and then, yet yeah, a few performances along the way in the first sort of dozen games that I played, uh, and I kind of yeah, I guess it builds your confidence and. You need that to, to realise that you can perform at that level. I suppose you had to bounce back as well from Port Elizabeth where NASA hung you out to dry in the World <laughs> Cup. Yeah. That's it. That's a big hit. It's six. That's a big, big six. It's hit the top of the sideboard. You learn probably more from those kind of scenarios where, you know, getting hit for six uh, in the last over of a game to, to then, you know, you lose the game. For your team you probably learn more from that than you do uh, often in, in good situations so I, I think for me that again that, that gave me confidence because NASA um, who you know I really looked up to uh, as captain giving me the responsibility to bowl in that situation where he could have gone for uh, Caddick who played you know however many games you know that, that actually once I got over the disappointment of losing the game and once they'd found the ball from the, the, the ocean, um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've felt like, you know what, he's got faith in me, so I should have faith in myself. Jimmy was the hardest bloke I ever had to captain. I only had him for a short period. And people took that the wrong way, as if he was a troublemaker, as if he wouldn't listen, whatever. He would listen, like the Mohammed Yusuf dismissal in that World Cup game against Pakistan. Duncan, the night before, we'd struggled to get Mohammed Yusuf out. How are we going to get him out? Full swing and delivery early on. I completely forgot. Anderson, two minutes in the game, full swing and delivery, poles all over the place. Mohamed Yusuf. Oh, beautifully bowled. Beautifully bowled by James Anderson. What a moment for him. He used to soak everything up. But when he used to stand at the end of his run and I used to talk to him, he would completely and utterly blank me. You know, they talk about sponges like Goff, who you'd hang on every word. But Jimmy used to just blank me as if to say, give me the ball. I know exactly what I'm doing. And after that PE game, I went to see him and he's playing pool with Ian Blackwell. And I thought, I better go and see this young lad. I made him loop bowl the last over and he's been hit into the ocean. And I went and saw him. I said, Jim, sorry about that, mate. I probably hung you out of dry there a little bit. He just looked at me, potted the black and walked off and had absolutely <laughs> no interest in me at all. But that, that almost, is expect, my expectation of him grew there actually, because I knew he was the lad that would be all right. He wasn't going to be too affected by setbacks. Jimmy talks about learning from your mistakes in that two year period where you didn't play. What did you learn and what were some of those tough moments early on? Yeah, I was actually talking to a friend of mine about it the other day and just saying like, I think the hardest thing for me to learn was just line and length bowling, you know, because I'd spent my whole youth trying to bowl as fast as I could and try and, like Jimmy said, scare people to get poles, you know, and, and that's how I got wickets. Um, even under Daryl, I did a lot of bowling where I'd come around the wicket, you know, bowl a lot of bounces, bowl a lot of short stuff, kind of scare someone, especially if nothing was happening in the game, and then come back over, bowl a half volley and, you know, a batter would just nick it, you know, and I kind of bought my wickets like that, but you can't do that at international cricket. Guys know how to hook and they know how to, how to duck and see you out of the attack. You know, three overs of bounces and then, and then you're done, you know. Um, so, spent a bit of time speaking to guys like Sean Pollock, who was probably, you know, my idol in terms of line and length bowling growing up. It's a great ball from Pollock. He's got him, the fingers up. Hussain uh, will have to go. Once again, he lingers in the crease, but uh, the finger went up. Immediately, a fabulous delivery from uh, Sean Pollock. How to swing the ball, how to hold the ball, and then, you know, go and play franchise cricket, go and play some county cricket and try and use those new skills and, and see how I could develop my game. Um, and it kind, of, it kind of got me going. And, and then when I, when I made my comeback into the South African team, uh, we played on some pretty sporty wickets. I mean, South Africa's got some pretty sporty wickets at the best of times. And New Zealand came to South Africa. And my first game back, uh, I got five wickets. And then from there, I kind of almost didn't miss a test series. Bowling! Stain gets his reward. One nil South Africa. Pettini and Stain, five each. 
Dale Staines, first five wicket haul in Test cricket, and only the second South African bowler to get five wickets in an innings this season. Well done, son. I was pretty much like Jimmy. I felt like I can play at this level now. I've done the work, and you know, let's let's kick it into the next year and and let's go. And Mickey Arthur, I think, was the coach at the time, and he gave me a run. Um, I think he, he wanted to have pace in the attack, so he brought in Mornay Morkel and he brought in myself. Um, and it was kind of the end of Sean. And that was a pretty good thing because, you know, if you see somebody like your idol, like Polly, being dropped for you, I mean, you know, <laughs> you're going to kind of feel like you're owning that, that kind of spot, you know. So, yeah, it was pretty cool at the time. How do you learn just to hold a length and be able to just live on that stop ball? just constantly landing it on a decent spot, bringing the batter forward wherever it is. How do you find that? Uh, awful. It was really difficult for me because um, I just kind of wanted to go back to what worked for me the whole time. You know, whenever I felt like I was trying to bowl the ball and string the ball, I'd over pitch and I'd get hit for four through the covers. And then I'd be like, nope, I'm just going to go back to what works for me. I'm going to bowl short. I'm going to you know, try and rev this guy up. And then, you know, hopefully he'll nick it or he'll miss one. Um, but through good captaincy, you know, um, when I'm trying to wrap my brain around it now, I had some pretty good captains who would do sometimes stupid things like, okay, cool, we're not going to give you a 7-2, you know, we're going we're gonna to put the guy in a cover and we're going to give you a little bit of protection because I hate getting driven for four. I think every fast bowler hates getting driven for four, you know. So I felt like, you know, put the guy in a cover, even put the guy out on the boundary. I'd rather go for one out there and, and then get confidence by bowling full. Um, and once you get one or two poles like bowling full and you, and you start to feel like you've got control, then it's a new way of getting wickets and you get into that groove and uh, you start practicing it more and it, and it becomes like a, a natural thing where like now I feel like I can run in with my eyes closed and I can hit a length. You know, I, I just, yeah. It's not something I have to practice. As Dale mentioned, when you, when you play international cricket, often the faster you bowl, if you don't do anything with it, you're not consistent with your length, you'll get hurt. And, it, and then you've got to find a way of either being consistent with your, your areas or actually doing something with the ball. So that's all I tried to, to do. I was I, Early on in my career, when I started trying to swing the ball, um, I still wasn't that consistent with it. Um, but at Lancashire, Warren Hague was my captain, and he, he'd often come up to me and go, forget about swinging it today, just ball quick. So it, again, that, that kind of helped trying to chop and change and know when to use that in a game, when to just try and ball flat out and when to actually try and control the game. Um, but I, I can't, honestly, when I think about it, there's not one thing that I've done other than practice and work really, really hard on hitting a length. Um, there's, no, there's no sort of magic thing that, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what it is that helps a bowler hit a length. It is, it is just hard work and the, the repetition of your actions. So again, inconsistency crept into my game when I started tinkering with my action. Duncan Fletcher wanted me to bowl a little bit quicker. So I think I was, I was around sort of late 80s, 90 miles an hour when I first started. But all, we were always looking for that extra two, three miles an hour, getting to the, you know, get towards the mid 90s. Um, and looking for that, that lost me so much consistency. And um, I think that kind of losing, uh, getting a stress fracture in, in 2006, then going back to my original action, that helped me so much because then it just felt, um, yeah, it just felt more natural. Everything felt more natural. Being able to swing the ball and then concentrate on hitting a good area. What was he like to face Nas? Because you saw him at the early days. I played against Jimmy in the early days. But what was he like back then when he first came around? I faced Jimmy Anderson one ball in a first-class cricket <laughs> game. That's it. I was, I was the middle delivery of a hat trick. I think he'd got Darren Robinson out. I went in. I was his in England captain, hoping for just one off the mark, off my hip or something, hit me straight on the toe with an in-swing in Yorker. Thanks for coming. And then he had to wait an over, and I think he then got Will Jefferson. Three massive names of world cricket here. Robinson, Hussein, and Jefferson was his, was his hat trick. He was a nightmare to face. He's also, he's got a stubborn streak, Jimmy, let's be honest. You know, the stuff about lengths, how many times have a commentator been saying, oh, Jimmy, if he could only bowl that little bit fuller. The one thing I want to ask Jimmy about, actually, is left-handers. You believe in your own way against left-handers. There's so many times that, you know, Suri and Botham, you look at those Ashes videos, he'd be swinging it in for left-handers, getting them LBW. You wanted to go round the wicket and swing it away from them, Graham Smith, etc. Why would that be? 
I don't necessarily want to come around the wicket all the time, but again, the, the uh, away swinger to a left-hander came into my game sort of around 2007-8, uh, so quite, quite, quite a, a way into my, my career. Um, but it, it get, took me so long to get confidence to bowl it in a game. Um, but that made a massive difference to me at, at, at bowling at left-handers because I always felt like, um, obviously, the in-swing is threatening. You threaten the stumps, you threaten the pad. But if you come up against someone like Graham Smith, that's exactly what he wants. He's he was unbelievably strong off his, off his pads and uh, off the stumps. So you, I felt like I had nowhere to go against someone like that. So then the, the out-swinger then gives me the option to... Um, it just, I just felt more in the game against left-handers doing that. And obviously, round the wicket, something Stuart Broad's done really well as, as well is, is doing that. And I think it, it's because left-handers have, have become wise to bowlers bowling at the stumps. And, the, you know, they grow up doing that. So they, I think we need something different as, as seam bowlers to, to left-handers. And, yeah, I think, my, my, again, my game and my career changed once I, I got that outswinger and... Uh, I had a lot more success against left-handers. Dale, Jimmy mentioned uh, Brody there, his partner in crime. Who was the bowler you liked the most, having the other end to you? Um, probably Vernon. The nice thing about Vernon was that he, he, his economy rate was so good. You know, he, went at, he hardly went at any runs. So he allowed me to kind of run in and, and I could bowl the odd half volley and, and get it wrong and go for a couple. And uh, Graham wouldn't immediately take me out of the attack because he didn't feel like he was leaking from both ends. Um, and the other strange thing about Vern is that he was always taking wickets too. So, you know, there was this kind of competition that was always going on too. It's like, how many wickets are either of us going to get? But, the, but I felt like he could really dry it up, Vern. Um, and obviously, when he, whenever he was drying it up, they felt like they had to take a risk against myself. And Mornay was, was always a great bowler. I thought he bowled beautifully to left-handers and did exactly what Jimmy did. Not a big swinger of the ball, but loved to come around the wicket and kind of just go away from the left-handers. I think he caused, he caused Andrew Strauss a little bit of trouble um, like that. And uh, kind of opened up my eyes to how you could bowl to left-handers because it's one thing watching somebody else doing it on TV. I mean, I watch Jimmy and, and Stuart bowl on TV, but I, I don't really have the opportunity to speak to them. But then I'm standing there and I'm talking to Morna and I'm asking him, why are you doing this? And, you know, and it's quite nice that he's right there. And then I try and do the same thing and, and stuff like that. So I was much the same. I didn't really bowl a lot around the wickets to, to left-handers. I like to kind of target the stumps with the, with the away swinger or the one that comes back into them, um, targeting the pads. Uh, and probably only much later that I start coming more around and trying to go that way across, you know, just by having guys in my team that were doing that. You liked hitting the stumps, didn't you? Some of my memories of you... Michael Vaughan, for some reason, springs to mind. Port Elizabeth or somewhere. Stumps cartwheeling all over the place. You love to, to target those stumps, right hand or all left. Oh, beautifully bowled. Dale Stain has got exactly what he wants from the last ball of the over. That's a wonderful delivery. Michael Vaughan has to go. His off stump is out of the ground. Much like Jimmy, you know, we, we both got, I think, the same kind of ball, you know, like what we're famous for, I guess, you know, it just comes out the hand beautifully, nice and straight, and then super late pitches on, say, middle or off, and then just straightens, you know, and guys tend to fall over and look to hit you through the onside or through um, mid-wicket, and, you know, it goes so late that that's what, it's, that's what it's all about, really. It's not trying to swing it early. Um, and listening to Jimmy speak earlier, Daryl Cullinan always used to say the same thing to me. He's like, don't worry about swinging it, you know, try and bowl fast, try and bowl straight, and any swing is a bonus. Um, it was only when I started to speak to guys like Sean Pollock that I learned how to swing the ball. But in the beginning, you know, I just wanted to bowl as straight and as, as fast as I could. And then any movement was a bonus. Um, and if it moves super late, you know, as a batter, it's, it's incredibly difficult. You know, you're eyeing up a big, you know, flick through, through mid-wicket and the next thing, your off stump goes cartwheeling. Um, and I had a little bit of success against Michael <laughs> like that. So, yeah. <laughs> you speak about swinging the ball, how you both learned to swing the ball. I'm assuming that's wrist and everything. What is that? How, what was the key moment when you thought, right, this is how I do it and how do you do it? Just for me, it was like when I got my first kind of wicket like that and it was, there's, there's that feeling, you know, there's like that came out like beautifully, you know, and it's just kind of that feeling that fast bowlers or even a batter, if you hit a beautiful crisp cover drive or something like that, you know, you feel like that's it. My feet were moving, my head was in the right position and all that kind of stuff. And the same thing for a bowler. When I got that feeling of how it comes out of my hand, um, 
I could almost, as I let go of the ball, go, that's it, I've got a wicket. Especially at, at franchise level, you know, you just knew. As you let it go, you're like, that's it, he's out. You know? and, <laughs> and then you get like this, like this bloodthirsty craving for this, that kind of feeling that it just happens all the time. And then you just want it to happen more regularly, you know. Um, and then you work, you'll do anything to work it up. Like, how did that happen? You know, where did it come from? Was it, yeah, was it this part of the wrist? Was, what was it? And then, you know, it just becomes like this, you know, this thing that you're just going for all the time. Oh, here's a close one. It isn't close. It is emphatically out. Del Stein strikes again for South Africa. Sachin Tinduka, the mainstay of the Indian Union so far, is on his way for 36. And the South Africans are elated. A brand new bowler to bowl with a brand new ball. First test wicket for James Anderson. Too good, too quick for Vermeulen. Oh, Pat first, out, yes! The finger goes up, the in-swinger from Anderson. That's what happens when you can swing the ball in both direction. For Anderson, what a wonderful, wonderful moment. It's the classic Anderson dismissal. Number 300, fantastic achievement that from Jimmy Anderson. Got him! That's what England have been waiting for, that's what Jimmy Anderson has been waiting for. He now becomes England's leading wicket taker. Oh, one side edge and gone! 400, Jimmy Anderson. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy. Absolutely amazing. Yeah! It's an elite club, and Anderson's just joined it. Welcome to the club, Jimmy Anderson. 500 test match wickets. That's a moment he'll never, ever forget. I literally didn't know how to swing the ball when I first got taught, when I was sort of 18, 19. Um, and it, for me, it's the feeling off the, off the fingers. And a lot of people from, from the outswinger, they, a lot of bowlers get taught to, to feel the, the middle finger coming off the ball last. But for me, I always use this finger and that gives me the feeling of pushing it into the stumps and then it going late, like Dale was talking about. So for me, it's a, it's a massive thing about feel and you do get that. What You've got to try and evaluate all the time how it feels, it, how it comes off the fingers. Is it, was the wrist cocked enough or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and just try and replicate that as much as you possibly can. Just a couple of questions for you, Dale, and, and it's a very difficult one for you to answer the first one, but I've got some stats here. As days at number one of the world rankings in bowling, Jimmy Anderson, 378 days, which is pretty good, number one world ranking. Dale Stain, 2,358 days as the number one bowler in the world. Do you sometimes feel you're a little bit sort of undervalued you know, I did it this winter in the South Africa tour. I came off comms and went, South Africa have had some great fast bowlers, Donald, Park, Pollock, and Tini, and, and Rabada, et cetera. And I forgot to mention you. I mean, do you think sometimes you are forgotten as one of the greats? Um, well, I don't know. I broke my shoulder for a couple of years. So, you know, I don't blame anybody for, for forgetting about me, you know. Um, but, you know, at the but do you think you're valued? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, you know, I mean, that's why, you know, I, I got this phone call today, you know, I guess. So, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, at the time, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it. I think I'm actually quite spoiled when I was playing for South Africa. I had a good captain in Graham. Um, and I, I felt for guys like Mornay and, and Harrow, uh, Paul Harris, you know, as our spinner, you know, they, they would do the donkey work. They really would do the donkey work. And they, they would build up pressure, they would eventually get a wicket. And as they got a wicket, they felt like, okay, this is it. You know, it's my opportunity to sneak two or three here. And Graham would take them out of the attack and put the ball in my hand. And then I'd go bang, bang, you know, wicket two. The best time to get a batter out is, you know, within his first 15 deliveries. So he'd give the ball to me. And, and most of the time bowling fast and straight, if I got it in the right place, I might be lucky enough to get a wicket. And Graham just used me in that way. And I guess, you know, for those 2000 something days as at the top, that was his, kind of recipe for success. Um, so you'd use everybody else to kind of do all the hard work and then you put the ball in my hand. And 
and I delivered, but at the same time, it was because it was a calculated decision by a captain uh, who used me well. Um, so I may not have gotten there under another captain. Um, I may not even have gotten there, have, have had better players, better bowlers that were more wicket-taking kind of bowlers or, or different kind of bowlers, not to say that they weren't good bowlers. Um, it may not have happened. So it was just, it was perfect timing kind of for me. You know, and, and on the back of that, while you were at the top of the rankings and the top of your game, David Saker was the bowling coach of England and he made a comment about Jimmy Anderson. He said, Jimmy Anderson was the most skillful bowler in world cricket. Did your ears prick up then and think, mm, hold on, or do you have a huge admiration and understood what Saker meant when he said most skillful bowler? I think you've annoyed him. <laughs> oh no! He's just thought. He's just. He just, just blanked me. He's just <laughs> like they're going on about me being valued. I mean, gee, <laughs> he forgot me. Doesn't mean everyone else did. <laughs> I didn't forget Dale Stain. You're putting us in your bracket. What a disgrace! <laughs> he, he's gone for a shave or something. Surely, come on, Dale. Where are you? So we ask the question again. Rick, did you hear the question? Yes, I got you. I got you. Um, you can just tell him the <laughs> if you want. <laughs> <laughs> ask the question again, Nass, and then you can go from there. Okay. Right? Right. You have a huge admiration for Jimmy. I like I watch Jimmy Bowl and like it's just he's ridiculous. You know, I'm actually I'm a bit of a fan. I'm not even gonna lie, Jimmy, I'm a fan. Um, <laughs> You know, and the thing is, we, we're always playing against each other, so you, you can't allow that to kind of come out. I, you, don't, you don't want to show that kind of, like, if it is called weakness, I guess, you know. But I knew that I was a limited, I had limited skill. I could bowl really fast. And um, as the years went on, I started to develop more skills. Uh, I learned how to swing the ball a little bit. I started to use the crease a little bit more. But I knew what my skill was, and that was to run in and kind of bowl fast and try and hit a length. And if that didn't work, I always had that other skill where I could come around the wicket and try and, um, you know, rev up a player or a batter and then come back over and then try and, and, try and nick him off or, or get him out through just aggression, you know. Um, but I was always limited in skill, you know. It was only when Vernon kind of came in when I felt like that was probably a better comparison because Jimmy's skill is ridiculous. I could never bowl those big inner swingers um, and use the crease the way that he did. Whereas I thought Vernon maybe is somebody that was more comparable to that. Um, although he doesn't swing it, it's more of a kind of seamer, off the deck kind of, kind of player. And that's a, that's a skill in its own, you know. I felt like maybe that's, that was a better comparison. Um, but I, I had, I've got no skill. Like, I'm kind of <laughs> you know, but a couple slow balls, a good fast bouncer and a Yorker, and then just try and hit the mark as often as I can. <laughs> what well, about in the England dressing room then? What do they think of Dale? I think it's only fair we try and give him you give him a chance to speak highly of him. Yeah, well, I mean, his record speaks for itself. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, unbelievable strike rate, unbelievable average. I mean, he's doing himself a, a disservice there. Definitely skillful because he could swing the ball at 90 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour plus, um, which is incredibly difficult to face. So, so he's kind of intimidating as, in, in more ways than one. I know when I went out to bat, I was... I knew he was going to try and attack my stumps, but I knew there could be a 90 mile an hour bouncer coming, which quite often there was. Um, so you can't, you just, you, you don't know where to look really. And it was, so yeah, it was, I mean, the attack there when, when we played was, was pretty, pretty impressive because you had uh, Mornay who was in uh, terrorizing our two left handed opening batters. Um, then you've got Dale, uh, Philander when he came on the scene as well. Just a great attack, Callis as well. A few years back, so great, a great attack. Talk, talking about like co the comparison as well. I, I, I've always seen me and Dale as very different bowlers. I, certainly, the back end of my career where I've had most of my success, I've not. Uh, I'm nowhere near as quick um, and try and use. I, yeah, I, I agree with the Philander sort of thing. Me and Vernon are very uh, probably more similar. Um, but Dale's someone who I've definitely watched and. In particular, with the Kookaburra ball, because I've always it's it's sort of been my nemesis for a few uh, for, for quite a long period in my career. How do you swing that Reb Kookaburra, um, like you know, as he as he has? So I've studied videos, um, you know, what slow motion trying to get the is it the wrist position? Is it you know whatever it is? 
Um, and I think that's, I think everyone does that. Every, you know, you, you try and to become as good as you possibly can be as a, as a cricketer, you've got to try and watch the, the best, uh, not just, you know, the best over the last however long, but also the best when you're the, the guys that you're playing against to try and soak up information to, so then you can be as good as you possibly can be. Jimmy, you've, um, I know you've had some injuries recently, but 150 test matches for a fast bowler is just ridiculous. Is that luck or is it what you do behind the scenes that no one sees the work you do? It's a bit of everything. It's definitely a bit of luck. Um, I think to have the physique that I've got, I'm quite a slim build naturally. Um, I don't have to watch my diet too much or I haven't had to. Certainly when I, since getting past 35, I've probably had to watch it a little bit more. Um, but I, I'm lucky that I do work fairly hard in the gym. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm like, I do loads more than anyone else, but I do do my fair share in the gym. Uh, and I'm lucky that my action is, is just repeatable and doesn't put too much strain on my body. So, yes, there's, there's luck in there, but also I, I, I do try and um, I still work on my action now, trying to make sure it's as economical as it can be and, and still do the work in the gym to make sure my body's as protected as it can be. You talked a bit earlier about how when you went back to your old action. Now, I'm assuming people try and change. I'm trying to remember. They saw at times they're trying to change bowlers. And I felt at times they're trying to change you to prevent you from getting injured down the line. But actually, what do you say to young bowlers who it's like, coach is telling you this, biomechanically, this is a better way to go. Or do you always just stick with that natural action? I don't know the answer to that. I, I think sometimes you do need the in intervention because there's definite, definitely a risk of injury with some bowlers and their actions. Um, what I would say is I, I try and stay away from big changes. I, I try and tinker with it rather than actually make wholesale changes to an action because it's so complex. And if, especially if you, if you bowl with it for a long time, like for me, I'd, I'd had that action since I was eight years old. Yeah. Um, when you then try and change that at 20 or 21, such a hard thing for your body to cope with and, and I, my body didn't cope with it and that's why I ended up with a stress fracture so it's just it's, it's a real you've got to try and weigh up and it's hard as a, as a youngster to, to do that you've got to put a little bit of faith in your coaches um, but I'd say yeah tinker but don't try and make big changes. About you Dal? You a tinkerer? Um, I've been fairly lucky I'm much like Jimmy really you know I've got a really easy repeatable action that hasn't really required a lot of, um, you know, altering. Um, I kind of worked on simple things to make sure that I didn't fall away a little bit, you know, so that my head stayed more still so that I could see the target where I wanted the ball. And, um, and I just kind of stuck with that, you know, I had, I had one or two things that Richard Pibus actually worked with me that I could use as keys. And then uh, I just had I probably had the best keeper in the world in Mark Boucher and we just kind of played catch over and over and over again. And um, the best thing was that whenever he saw something was out, he'd run over to me. He'd first swear at me because that was Boucher's way of doing things. <laughs> and then he would say to me, okay, I've noticed that your left arm is falling away. So try and try and hold it up a little bit longer. Or I've noticed that you're running at too much of an angle or you're too straight compared to what you were doing last week when you were bowling fast and taking wickets. So, it was always good to have that, um, that person that was there all the time. And that was probably Mark. But I'll always go back to, to like Jimmy says, you know, what worked for me um, when I first started. Uh, and uh, those coaches in the beginning and Mark kind of signaled out what it was. And I, I, still, I still do it today. You know, I know like my left arm is like my kind of guy. You know, like when it's falling away, it's going to drag me over. Yeah, but most, for the most time, I've been quite lucky. Not as bad as Mornay Morkel, who's always thinking about his action. <laughs> <laughs> I played Mornay. He was like that all the time. He had, oh, he had... it's a nightmare. You know, you stand a bit off and I, I feel like I'm exhausted after the end of his over. Just telling him, <laughs> you're looking good, mate. You're looking good. Don't worry. <laughs> Dale, tell us about the body, mate. A, a how is your body at the moment? Uh, and B, just give the, you know, the listener, the viewer, people who don't bowl fast, what effect does fast bowling have on the body? I mean, it's, it's tough, you know, I think but fast bowling, luckily being a cricketer, you know, you've got the long trousers and, and everything like that. And uh, you always kind of, it's not like football, you know, so you're always hiding the ankle strapping and the knee strapping and, and you know, the, the thigh guards and all that kind of stuff um, and the shoulder strapping. 
Um, but I was quite lucky that I went the bulk of my career with like small injuries, maybe the odd hamstring tear or quad or something just through, you know, the amount of work that we were doing, you know, fast bowling, you're always running in and it's, it's bound to happen. You know, you're bound to do a, a calf or a hamstring or something like that. Um, but I, I, my big one was my shoulder. You know, I broke a bone in my shoulder and uh, had to, it required to be, put a big pin in there. Um, so it took a lot of work to come back from that. Um, and I guess the second worst injury I had, I, uh, I got now during the lockdown, I was sweeping in the house and I slipped a disc in my back. So, <laughs> so do the housework. Me. <laughs> Jimmy, who's that person for you that you would, that you'd be able to turn to when you're, you're falling over, whatever it is as a bowler? I mean, it's difficult. I, th I think you always need someone on the field and, and that's where, myself and Stuart work really well together because over the, the last few years, the last 10 years or so, we've kind of got to know each other's action really well. So if, if he's not feeling right, I can try and sort of keep an eye on him from, from mid off. Uh, and, see, and, and I also know his checklist as well. So I can say, are you pumping your legs enough or um, is your, are you falling away? Like Dale said, I think that's a key for quite a lot of guys. That's my, I wear a sweatband all the time just so I can see it out of the corner of my eye and make sure it's going. Um, at the target um, so we, we kind of just I like using guys on the field Matt Pryor was great when he was uh, keeper um, and you mentioned David Saker and Otis Gibson as well two, two coaches that I, I love working with so we again lucky that to play with the players that I have uh, and had the coaches that we have as well well that's uh, very very convincing just one stump left standing as Anderson has pummeled his way through Sachin Tendulkar's defences. I think one of the, the great battles or the, the great battles that I've seen, whether it was in the winter in a studio in Isleworth for Sky or in the summer watching you bowl, Jimmy, was you boys versus Sachin. And you both actually have quite good records against him. Start with you, Jimmy. What was that like? What was your theory against Sachin? I don't, I don't really remember having like a specific game plan to him. I just knew that once he came in, I was, uh, in my mind, I was like, right, I cannot bowl a bad ball here. He was that good a player. And obviously a key for them as well. Uh, and particularly in India, if you can get him out, the whole atmosphere of the ground changes. So he was such a big wicket. Um, and you just try and focus so much on bowling your best ball, top of off stump all the time and hope that he missed a straight one or... Uh, he got, in England, he might, have, he might have nicked the odd one, but generally I'd, I'd try and get him out of LBW early. Uh, but again, I mean, yeah, I had some success against him, but he had success against me as well. He, he, got, he got runs against us quite a lot. I felt like when he came in, it was, you had to up your focus on how you were going to hold that length and try and hit the top off stump, uh, especially in a place like India. If you could just get the ball to come back in at him a little bit, you might, you might get him out of LBW, but he was so good, he very rarely got out of LBW. And yeah, like Jimmy said, you just didn't want to bowl a bad ball to him because if he, if he, especially in a place like India, you know, you bowl a bad ball and he hits you for four, he's on noughts and he hits you for four in, in Mumbai and it feels like the world is closing in on you and he's only on four, not out, you know, <laughs> like he may as well have been on 500. Um, so you didn't want to bowl a bad ball. So you felt like, okay, cool. Maybe I could bring the pace down a little bit and really focus on, on getting the ball in the right place for as long as I possibly could. Um, you just didn't want to bowl a bad ball, bad ball to him. And then just hope, you know, like he's got it covered. You know, he had every shot in the book. Uh, and you just hope that one will do something off the seam or he's got an off day and, and it goes in your favour. But he did score a lot of runs against us. I mean, he made a double hundred. He scored the first double hundred in ODI cricket. And it was against us in Gwalior. Um, and I actually remember, I, I think I got him out LBW on about 190 odd. And... Gouldy was the umpire, he gave him not out. And I was like, Gouldy, why, why did you give him not out? That's stone dead. And he's like, mate, look around. If I gave him out, I would make it back to the hotel. <laughs> you talk about India there. Your, is your career best seventher in Nagpur? Would that be your best bowling performance, would you say? I got lucky at Nagpur, Nas, to be honest with you. Um, you know, they, they just started to score, they were starting to score some runs, India. And um, Graham went up to the umpires, I can't remember who the umpires were, and he said, listen, this ball is it's busted. I don't know, the seam is split or something like that. And they said, sure, they'll change it. And they changed it. And the first ball back, I ran in and it just had this, it just reversed, it just 
that went flying in. I can't remember who the batter was. And he fell over and he clipped it straight to mid-wicket. And we didn't think it was going to reverse. And then every other batter that came in after that, I don't think they thought it was going to reverse either. They left the ball, they were bowled. Um, and then I got into the tail enders and I hit the pads and I hit the stumps a couple of times. But literally, if it wasn't for that ball change, uh, they could have still been batting right now. <laughs> <laughs> How do you deal as bowlers with those moments when it's so flat, a batsman's in, whoever it is, could be Peterson, any other great batsman, Graham Smith, whoever. How do you deal with that, Jimmy, at the top of your mark where you're just like, I've got nothing to work with here. Everything's in their favour. How do you sort of keep on going? I guess um, you've just got to try and think, you know, the captain's giving you the ball. You're the one in, in control. You've got to try and make something happen. And I think it's something that I've had to get better at over, the, over my career because, you know, I remember times just whinging to probably Brody at mid-off, like, why, what's the point of me bowling here? Get the spinners on or whatever. <laughs> um, but I think you've, you've got to try and, you just got to try and figure out ways of, of getting, getting people out. And that's kind of, I've enjoyed that challenge over my career. So going to India when it's flat and the crowd are, are, are buzzing for, for Sachin or Dhoni or Kohli and trying to actually silence them and, and find ways of getting them out is actually quite an exciting challenge. So it's just trying to, keep that focus, keep that challenge, rather than getting yourself down in the dumps. Jimmy, you talked about um, having, having to improve. You know, any positive thing about Jimmy Anderson that's put out there, there'll always be someone below the line saying, what about Jimmy away from home? What about Anderson with the Kookaburra ball? Is he just one dimensional in England? What would you say to those people? Are they right? Or do you think you've put that to bed as well? Well, they've got a point probably. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I think the, the Duke obviously has, has been a huge help to, to me in my career. Um, and, not, and I mean, it helps that it swings, but you've still got to put the ball in the right area, even when it does swing. That's one thing I'll say. Um, but I have found it a challenge away from home, getting you know finding ways of getting wickets on, uh, yeah, getting wickets on, on flat pitches with balls that, that don't generally swing. Um, but I've, I think I've, I'm happy with how I've improved over the years away from home. Um, I probably haven't torn it up anywhere, but I've still done a good job for, for the team. And we've won, helped the team win series in India. Uh, we won in Australia, uh, in South Africa. So, I'm, you know, we've, we've had good results uh, away from home in, when I've been a part of the team. So I, th I hope I've, I've done a decent job uh, away. U UAE on some flat pitches against Pakistan. You and Brody had some great stats, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it, is, it has been a challenge. Like, the biggest thing that helped me was, was starting to practice with balls that didn't swing. So the easiest thing for a bowler is to go in the nets and pick the newest ball out of the bag and then start swinging it around corners. Uh, you look like a million dollars. But actually, practicing with a ball practicing with a sock and trying to hit the top of off relentlessly, trying bowling cutters, leg cutters, off cutters, just trying to do something different to, uh, and picking up different skills along the way to, to, to get people out. I think um, I've enjoyed that challenge and uh, yeah, I'd like to think that I've done a decent job at it. What about you, Dale? Where, where's the hardest place to bowl for you? Where's been, where's been where you've just thought, you know what, this is going to be really hard work this trip? I would probably say Sri Lanka is right up there. You know, you're just, you're always sweating. Um, the ball seems to never stay dry. And all you want the ball to do is stay dry so you can get it to reverse because that's how you're going to get wickets. And, um, you know, I found it really tough to bowl there. Even though I got wickets there, I, I did pick up a couple of fifers there and everything like that. But in saying that, again, you know, I was, I was lucky that I had a captain like Graham because he'd always go, you know, Eight, nine, ten, and eleven. You'd be like, yeah, he has the ball, and I'd really manage to blow away the tail and 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 take some wickets. So you know, I put my hand up and say that I, I didn't always get out the best batters in in the most difficult places that I've ever bowled in. You know, I always got out the tail enders, which is a skill in itself, but still, you know, um, and they count. That's that's the bad thing. You get number eleven out, and it counts exactly the same as you got the you you got number the opening batter out. You know, it's it's a pull. Um, 
So, you know, I, I had that skill, but, but Sri Lanka was tough. Like, um, I always found India, that there was something in, in India, the, the SG there, the, the seam really stands out a little bit. So, um, if it hit the seam, it would do something. Even on sometimes the flattest of days, you could run in and bowl like a uh, fast cutter and you might get someone caught at cover or caught mid-wicket or something. Try and pick up wickets, not the normal way that you pick them up in, say, England or in South Africa, like caught slip or something. You know, a caught at cover or caught down the leg side, leg slip. Um, is just as good as caught first slip, you know, in, in those places. Um, but Sri Lanka was tough. You know, my last tour there, oh, it was ridiculous. Um, I don't think I got a wicket in my last test match there. And I just, I was happy to walk off the field and say, okay, I'm done with this place. I'm not coming back <laughs> <laughs> anymore. Uh, yeah, it was really rough. Eh? What, about, um, what about away from the game, guys? What about you away from the game? Dale, you're a bit of a bit of a surfy and like your fishing and stuff. You like to get away from it, don't you? I love it, Ness. I mean, I, I grew up in um, a small town, pretty much which was, part, which was part of the Kruger National Park. So you know, to wake up in the morning and have whatever on the lawn, you know, from elephant to you know hippo or whatever it was, you know, that was kind of my youth. Um, yeah, I thought you were talking about, I... about food there. <laughs> 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 I was sort of drifting. I thought, what? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, and then I just spent a lot of time in the bush. You know, I did a lot of fishing and everything. And um, and now I live in Cape Town, and uh, I've got a spot here in Komiki, which is in Cape Point. Uh, and we're on the beach. Uh, I do a lot of surfing, um, and it's nice to get away from the game. Although the thing is, the game is the one place where I feel like I've got control. Like it's it's the one thing that I'm really really good at. I can get onto the field and nothing else kind of worries me. You know, no stresses at home. If the girlfriend's giving me some trouble, it's fine. I'm going to go onto the cricket field. I'm going to take it out on the batters, you know. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, you know. Um, but, but I do like to get away from the game because the game does bring its own stress, as you guys all know. So, you know, getting out into the surf and going fishing and those kind of things. Uh, yeah, I love it, you know. Yeah, I, I guess similar. I, I mean... Uh, don't go surfing. There's not much surfing <laughs> in Manchester, but um, the the I think the players who've who've had a lot of success over the years have, have found a really good balance uh, of being away from the game enough and then being refreshed when they come back to to cricket. Uh, it's really because Test cricket does really take it out of you both mentally, probably more mentally than uh, than physically. Um, so you do need that break from the game every now and then. Um, but again, I'm I'm like Dale. Once I get on the field, that is like that feels like uh, my natural habitat. We did one of these with Brody not long ago, Jimmy, and I actually couldn't believe this. And I don't think it's right. He reckons that you were grumpier than him. And I played a bit with Brody, and I know he's probably the most stubborn person I know. What do you reckon? Definitely the most stubborn player I've ever played with. Um, I, I think I think I saw a quote from that, and he he said that he mentioned the time when um, me and Ruthie had a fight about where my fine leg was. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I refused to bowl. But the amount of times where he's refused to bowl without a cover, he's like, "Get a cover in now, get a third slip out," and, and he literally st stood there, arms folded, at the end of his mark. I'm not bowling until I get a cover. <laughs> yeah, he he's um, ex yeah, most stubborn player I've ever played with. <laughs> Boys, um, we've done an hour there. I could actually keep going and going, but we've all we've not got much. Keezy, Keezy, before you go, I'm going to ask you some questions. I know you say stats are, are for prats, as you're saying, but I just want to top trump you on these two. I'm going to embarrass these two, okay? You've right. got to choose between these two. Some of them are easy, some of them are hard. Yeah. One day international, Stain or Anderson, who played more? Stain. Jimmy Anderson, 194. Dale Stain, 125. Wickets, who got more ODI wickets? And he is the last man, that's it. Five wickets up for Dale Stain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Stain, because you've, you've clearly asked questions. And, and Jimmy Anderson, who had the better <laughs> strike rate? Oh, no one cares about one day cricket. <laughs> um, Jimmy Anderson then. No, Dale Stain, you're north from <laughs> four here. Economy, who had the better economy? Uh, Dale Stain. Dale Stain. One. He's not going to be here for long today. Michael Vaughan is gone. 
And Dale Stain has picked him up. That's uh, pretty much a trademark Stain delivery. Right, test match cricket. Obviously, test wickets. Who had the better average? Stain. 22.96. Who had the better strike rate? Well, Stain. Uh, uh, okay, go on, down your Who, record, people. Who so had the best bowling good. figures? I've got that somewhere. Um, <laughs> no, God, <geez. laughs> Uh, I think it's uh, Jimmy. Jimmy Anderson, 7 for 42. Dale Stain, 7 for 51. Oh, that's hard. That's a beauty. Five wicket hauls. Anderson or Stain? Stain. Jimmy Anderson, 28. Dale Stain, 26. Who had more 10 wickets in the match? Anderson. Anderson, 3. Stain, 5. Batting. Who got the most test runs? <laughs> well, <laughs> he wanted four from it, and uh, he got it. This is what I want to hear. Who got the most test runs? I would say... Don't go to your phone. Uh, Jimmy. Dale Stain, 1,251. Jimmy Anderson, 1,185. Highest score. Who had the highest score? In Test Jimmy. cricket. Oh, no, uh, Dale. Jimmy Anderson, 81. Dale Stain, 76. <laughs> well, well, there is the pull shot. There is a pull shot and there is the half century for Jimmy Anderson. I've told you this one. At the top of the tree in the world rankings, Jimmy Anderson, 378 days. Dale Stain, 2,358. The reason I wanted to end on stats, I know you say stats are for frats, but these two, they are quite remarkable stats. These are two wonderful bowlers.